recording or anything, just let me know. Um, so for posterity, <laughs> um, we, we just did a round of introductions. Um, and so we're us and uh, we're jumping into the, <laughs> into the conversation point of what are one or two things that you learned at the summit um, that will influence your work this year. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, for me, so I have a background, I guess I would say more in like accessibility, like the WCAG standards, this kind of thing. So more of like a compliance. Um, so the whole universal design for learning framework was actually pretty new to me. So I just felt like I came away from the conference with a better understanding, um, sort of uh, the framework overall. And um, so yeah, so I'm still, I'm, I'm doing some reading, kind of catching up. Um, I'm planning on doing a, a activity here with some of my colleagues to kind of um, crowdsource some ideas for how we might implement some of these strategies, like specifically in our, we use Canvas. Um, so, you know, some specific concrete strategies for how we, our faculty might be able to implement those. But um, I would say also too, I attended the higher education panel, which I really enjoyed. And um, it was just nice to kind of hear from, um, from folks how they've had some success uh, getting buy-in from faculty because that's always uh, um, yeah it's always a little bit of a challenge at times to get folks um, excited about these kinds of like new maybe it's not new but um, you know different initiatives and this kind of thing so I thought that was really helpful. Julie, I don't know if you've seen it yet um, there, there's a, a massive open online course called Implementing UDL on Canvas I just dropped a link in the chat. Uh, oh thank you this is awesome. You might find useful. Yeah, we are actually, we are just, we just announced last week to faculty that we're moving from Blackboard to Canvas. So I'm super excited about it. Yeah, that, that's why I built this, this course because our faculty were doing the same and I, you know, felt that Canvas was a lot more robust, but people would use it the same way they used Blackboard unless they had yeah. to do otherwise. Oh, dude, thank you so much. This is awesome. Yeah. And so when, when you talk about, um, so you're coming from accessibility. And, and from that that sort of ADA 504 kind of kind of perspective, mm -hmm. the UDL expanding on on that background. Well, I mean, it's sort of been more of like a I guess I want to say like a legalistic kind of approach where it's kind of like we're going to get sued if we don't have transcripts, we're going to get sued if we don't have captions, this kind of thing, and it's very. Um, I guess prescriptive maybe is the right word, or it's very like it's, I don't know, I feel like UDL is more about giving choices and expanding access and giving different methods or different routes, right, for people with different like um, learning preferences. And I just feel like it's a more robust way of making the course engaging. And I, whereas, you know, WCAG and, and the compliance stuff is really more about making things like sort of like basically accessible to people who might have, you know, vision impairments and hearing impairments and this kind of, you know, using assistive technologies. I feel like UDL is, you know, while, while captions and stuff can improve the experience for every for everyone, I think that UDL is a little bit more about creating a better experience for everybody, like no matter where you're at, what your learning preference is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just feel like it's kind of to the same end, I guess, and it's, it's it, it definitely overlaps, um, but I feel like UDL is just, it's more expansive. Nice. That's such an in, it's such an important um, intersection. Like yes, it's, mm -hmm. it's so important. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? Well, I have a question kind of related to that, and I'm actually having a meeting with someone else on Monday to talk about it more. And I posed the question to Eric, and I was hoping to bring it up more as a topic to discuss at the summit. But what we have done at Cengage is we've got a big umbrella philosophy of inclusivity. And then underneath that, we're going to use UDL as the framework to address inclusivity. And then within UDL, we are going to address the WCAG standards. But part of the problem is, is they don't really map directly to each other. And so how do you kind of communicate that um, so that people realize that you are meeting the WCAG standards by doing UDL when there is not that kind of direct connection? You mean the, like the WCAG standards? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, that's a great, a great one. Does anyone want to jump in on that? That's a, such an important one, Deb. Because yeah, I've sat down and I've tried to do that. And yeah. then when I, I'll start like 
getting in my own head and it just gets really complicated. And there definitely are some that do not connect at all. And then other ones you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not really sure. Where does this go? Does this one work? Yeah. I mean, there are definitely some, right, you know, optimizing access to tools and assistive technologies is one of the standards under you know, physical actions. I, I feel like you could tie a lot of, like, you know, if you meet WCAG standards, blah, 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 right? Like that would map directly to that standard. And then, you know, offering alternatives for auditory information, like transcripts and captions would, you know, and offer alternatives for visual information with, you know, your, your alt text and all of those like WCAG standards. So I feel like, I don't know if that would help you, like maybe mapping back those specific WCAG standards to the actual like UDL um, standards. That's what I've tried to do, mm -hmm. but there are some that just don't fit within it. And part of the issue is, is UDL is a new thing mm -hmm. for us, and everybody is so focused on the WCAG 2.0 AA standards and compliance that trying to get them to focus a little bit more away from those mm -hmm. <laughs> and starting to look at the UDL and how they are going to be able to embrace that by using UDL is, is a little complicated. Well, I will I, agree with you there because it's a, it's a culture change and I, I'm facing, you know, kind of the same issues, right? Like we have some, frankly, I have some faculty who don't care at all about, you know what I mean? That's for the Disability Resource Center to figure out. Like they, they don't care about WCAG at all. Mm -hmm. I have some who care minimally, you know what I mean? They just want to meet the standards. And, and then, you know, there's some faculty who definitely will care about UDL and they'll be interested in implementing. So it really, for me, it, it comes down to the individual person. But I mean, honestly, it, it's something I struggle with as well. I don't know how you make, I think it, it's just, it has to be like a mm, overarching like culture shift. And I feel like that happens very slowly and like one person at a time kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, neither here nor there, but I just, I sympathize. <laughs> <laughs> One, one way I've explored it is, you know, taking this idea that when we talk about accessibility, like there's always two aspects to accessibility. We have who is gaining access to what. And when we say accessibility, we typically have hard coded that to be people with disabilities gain access to places and content, basically, right? Um, so, so can you get into the classroom? Can you access the textbook, can you see the screen, you know, those kinds of things. So physical spaces and content as the, as the object and people with disabilities as the subject. Um, and what I think UDL does is it expands what we mean by accessibility on both sides of that. So it's not just people with disabilities, it's everybody who, all of us are predictably diverse. It's not this binary, you have a disability, you don't, um, this predictable variability. And then on the other side, it does still contribute, especially in the, the first row of the, of the guidelines, the access row, still does contribute to that, providing access to, to physical spaces to some extent, not really, but definitely to materials. And then it expands on that, providing access to learning, to comprehension, to, um, and to expert learning ultimately. So moving well beyond what the law requires, you know, so like, like, so when we talk about um, supporting comprehension through, through pro guiding, understanding of big ideas and concepts, that doesn't appear anyway in, in ADA 504, 508, you know, that's, that's clearly a much more advanced concept um, that, that deals with learning, like real learning and, and getting our students to the point where they can learn more independently, being resourceful, knowledgeable, strategic, goal-directed, all that good stuff. So it's an expansion on both sides of what we mean by accessibility. You actually just give me a great idea for a graphic. Like I had done the graphic more kind of tiered or, or vertical, but I don't know if you can see this. I did like concentric circles with mm -hmm. accessibility in the middle, then UDL, and then the inclusivity mm -hmm. as the larger one, which mm -hmm. I don't know, might be an easier way to visualize what you were just saying. Yeah, yeah. And okay. um, you know, where where the guidelines are covering so much ground, they don't go as in depth, they're intentionally very broad. And so the WCAG guidelines and, and other accessibility guidelines go into much greater detail. And mm -hmm. I, you know, to me, that's just zooming in on especially the, 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 one, the, the first principle, providing access to um, materials, whatever that is, you know, what the options for um, visual information, options for auditory information, options and so forth. It really just zooms in on, on that representation access level 
in greater detail. So I don't see them as in any way contradictory. Um, and certainly if, if, you're, if your setting is requiring that we abide by AA, WCAG guidelines, that's a great start to UDL. And then we talk about um, how can we expand what we're doing to include more people to greater levels of rigor to achieve higher outcomes for everybody. Yeah, no, that's good. I think we were trying to kind of say that if you do UDL, you would be addressing WCAG too, but it's hard because you can't directly map them. So it's almost like you have to do WCAG and then go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is, it's tricky. Like in Ontario, we have, um, like we do WCAG and then we have the AODA standards. Um, we don't have ADA. And, um, and so figuring out that relationship has, is really, can be tricky sometimes. One way that um, we've been working to think about it is um, talking about accessibility um, and quality and learning experiences. So the goal of UDL is to develop expert learners and to design for learning variability and to maintain that rigor. Whereas the goal, um, how we're talking about it, the goal of accessibility is to remove, reduce and eliminate barriers. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's rigor, it doesn't mean that there's engagement, it doesn't mean there's a quality experience, it's just barrier free um, to the widest range of users, including those with disabilities. And so that's a really important first step, like Eric's saying on the um, on that first um, bar that kind of access row in the in the guidelines, and allows you to design a UDL environment. But that alone isn't UDL, um, but it does help enable the to build a UDL design within. You can't have a UDL design without accessibility, without making, without those things. But the legal part is is tricky. Um, we found it tricky too on how to say, okay, we're we're obligated to do this and this is important and required, but there's also this enormous design flexibility and creativity and expert learning on this side with UDL too. Mm -hmm. So one of the analogies that we've drawn um, to go with the architecture um, extension of universal design is safety. So like safety in a building, you can have a very safe building and have it not be beautiful or engaging or a place anyone wants to spend time and time in <laughs> it's totally safe because like you have a place that's totally accessible but nobody would want to spend any time there right um and and talking about safety and accessibility is just how you do business like that's just how you we do it like for i work at a college that has a lot of labs and that safety is number one it just it's the air we breathe right and so trying to get accessibility in that lens too so again, you can have a very safe lab. Um, you can have the very safe carpentry lab and not have it be a spot where anyone's gonna learn anything. Um, just like you can have a very accessible space and have it not be a spot for learning. Um, so I don't know if that helps or not, but that's one of the ways that we've tried to differentiate um, between um, access and UDL. No, that's good. I'm glad we're recording this. <laughs> it's a lot to take in. Other, other takeaways from the summit, from those of you who are there? I mean, I can say something that, and it kind of relates to what Julie was talking about a little bit, is trying to get everybody on the same page about UDL. And um, a woman was talking about this. I actually went for the leadership day at the very beginning. And what she'll do to try and get people on the same page is ask people what their values are with respect to education and people start sharing their values and then she'll start to kind of categorize them and start to relate them to UDL that, you know, this is a value of yours and this is how it can be addressed through UDL. And I just thought it was a great, great way to start get people thinking about it and getting them on board before they really even know what it's all about. So it's just was something to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something Allison was talking about this morning as well. Um, the, the idea of, of leading with the why rather than the what of, of UDL um, and really getting people to buy in before they even know what UDL is. And, and I think that's a great concrete approach to take. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Other takeaways or, or questions from the summit? 
I wasn't able to attend the summit, but I'm super excited about hearing what you guys are discussing and then also possibly um, listening to the recording from this morning to hear those takeaways. Mm -hmm. And we, we purposely cleared the notes because we wanted, we didn't want the notes to guide this conversation because we think you guys will have a different takeaways. And no crib sheets. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but we'll put the link in. <laughs> so, well, um, Jody and I wanted to to share one of one of our major takeaways. Um, you know, you guys probably couldn't have have missed Katie Novak's talk, which was quite quite powerful. And she is she's known for being a, you know a an energizer and somebody who um, who really gets people excited about about UDL. Um, she's just fantastic at that, and her talk this year was second to none for that um and what one of the things that we that um some of us have been trying to do since the summit was we had this idea of merging the model that she had of of the uh innovators early adopters through through laggards and we have this in the notes if you're trying to figure out what i'm referring to um and then brian dean in a separate talk had um referred to this sort of I can't remember what this model was, but it was basically this this um, model exploring when technology or whatever or some other innovative thing comes out, and you've got this super excitement, and then you know the trough of disillusionment, and then you know things we start seeing how it's actually useful, <laughs> and then we have this you know plateau of productivity, and we wanted to see what would happen if we were to overlay these. And so, you know, we had this brilliant idea. We were going to do something original, and we went to Google, and of course, it's been done. <laughs> but, but it's still it's still useful. So that's what we have here, and, and it was really helpful for us to see both of these and see how they interrelate. So, in the the model that Katie used down below, the one that looks like a bell curve, um, you know, we have this idea of of where you know a way of mapping where we are with UDL and. It, in being able to recognize that we are as a holistic community early adopters and in a higher ed sense i think we're closer to innovators than we are to early majority um within that we're, we're really quite early in this process and, and pioneers and in katie's talk it was about recognizing that chasm that's there between the early adopters the minority proponents of udl and actually facilitating systemic change with the early majority, late majority kind of thing, um, and how that gap is very difficult to cross. Um, so she had called on uh, an, another model that looked at this idea of, of people as mavens or connectors or salespeople, where mavens are basically those who are really knowledgeable and driven by the theory and the content and know a lot and want to share what they know. You've got the connectors who are all about bringing people together and saying like, oh, I know somebody who could help you with that, <laughs> you know, and putting people together. And then you've got the sales people who are the ones who are evangelizing, you know, reaching out to people who don't already know about this and trying to get them in, not taking no for an answer kind of thing. And as, as Jody and I were talking about this, we, we wanted to give the smallest of critiques to Katie because we love her so much. But, but we don't think that people are, are one or the other of these and, and certainly not all the time in all situations that people uh, we know are variable and you probably do these different things at different times. And being as isolated as we tend to be in higher ed, uh, we have to be all three of these <laughs> you know, as, as the EDL facilitators and navigators in our context. And Katie's call was to get us over this chasm, whether you're a maven or a connector or a salesperson, you have to do more of what you do. Um, and so in our case, that's in ex compounded <laughs> by the fact that we're doing all of those things. But uh, her, her point was, was salient and, you know, we do recognize that, it, that it's necessary. And it's been helpful for me to um, personally and to, to hear other people kind of talk about um, moving through that trough of disillusionment, you know, and, and to feel like I've been there and, and sometimes today I am there, <laughs> you know, and, and to, to hear other people are, are there too. And that's okay to give voice to that, that we can be proponents of UDL and also feel like I'm not sure this is going to work out. You know, I don't really know if I'm the one to be carrying this banner. Um, it's okay to feel that way and to recognize that that's part of the process. Um, of, of being where we are as early adopters, we uh, have to 
we have to take that pain of disillusionment onto ourselves um, and power through it in order to get across that chasm and bring people into rebuilding what it really will look like and, and how it will change the landscape of higher education. Okay, Judy, um, Jody, do you want to add to that? No, I think that I, it is. It's just seeing the visual, like it, it really helps explain and give words to some of those feelings where it's like, oh, this is really great today or it's really tough today and, um, and helps explain that that is an um, expected feeling as we're, as we're scaling and, and growing this. Um, but yeah, but we're really interested in um, what you're looking for or what you see your work as connecting with these kind of, these roles of Maven, connector, salesperson. If you see that in your work now, if those are areas where you want to grow, or if those are areas that this group um, in different ways could help, we could help each other grow in by sharing experiences or resources, learning, all those good things. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, kind of launch into part two of our, our chat is what you might need to help um, further your work as a maven, as a connector, as a salesperson, as a little bit of both of being a UDL navigator in higher ed. So again, jump in, open floor. I totally forgot what I was going to say. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Um, um, no, I was going to say, I think for me, um, again, being fairly new to this and being in the role of essentially a consultant with faculty, um, they can take my advice or not take my advice. Um, but I think for me, I guess I find that I fall more, I suppose, in the, like, the Maven category, just in the sense, like, really, we're a very high volume team. I serve 300 plus faculty members so um you know we really rely a lot on scalability on creating resources that we can share with faculty um our one-on-one -on -one time we're we're not a super high touch team so um you know I, in terms of like i i ideally like most of the time when we create resources those are available publicly through our uh, teach online it's asu's like um faculty focus but it's it's open to anybody we we write a lot about you know best practices in online education but um so i think just in terms of like i you know i'm i'm looking to this group to, to learn more definitely about udl um to get some best practices for what has worked other places um you know uh if anybody has any like success stories or um you know things like that i think that is really extremely helpful um and yeah, just, just um, you know, if nothing else too, I, I agree that sometimes it's nice to just, um, sometimes when you're having those days where you feel kind of, uh, you know, in it, it's, it's nice to chat with colleagues who may be, you know, kind of experiencing those same feelings, so. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, love the resource sharing too, and talking about how each of us use those resources in our own context, right? Because one resource can look totally different um, depending on the context that we're into. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Any other uh, Mavens, connector salespeople out there? Sure. I'm going to piggyback on what you just said in terms of the resources. In College Star, we're embarking on our fourth phase, and one of the main initiatives is not just building a network, but also a repository of resources that can be used by everything, everyone. And really looking at, as you said, not just how it's used in one context, but maybe across several different settings or several different content areas. So we're really eager to have partners and to collaborate with folks that are willing to share those case study examples, create those modules so they're open source and access to everyone, so. Jennifer, I feel like you and I should have a conversation. <laughs> um, in a couple weeks um, in Ontario, there's uh, some grant money that's coming out. It's for, called eCampus Ontario. They put out grants each year and they are, um, they do a lot with open educational resources. And so we're trying to put together just some early ideas on how we could um, do that in terms of a UDL PLC and when we have this faculty open pedagogy textbook thing that's really really cool and uh, But yeah, but we should we should talk 
Sounds great. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we have any modules. Do we have any on the open educational resource? I haven't looked lately. Not, yet. not to my knowledge, Lily, and not yet. No, that would be wonderful. We could really use an OER uh, module or case several case studies, something like that would be a fantastic addition. So, have we tried using um, Cast Book Builders for for making OER? Yeah, I I have. Um, I find it a little bit bulky myself um but i haven't i haven't given it a go in a couple of years okay yeah. i don't know if they've updated it in a couple of years but <laughs> um, if, like if, if you the look option. at the, the udr theory and practice text like udr theory practice cast .org, have you been there uh, i'll put it in here is there, so so they you know david rose and um ann meyer and david gordon published a book in 2015 um, they introduced the UDL guidelines 2.0, and um, it was you know it was basically a theory and practice book. That was forty dollars if you bought it in print, or free if you accessed it online, which is what they wanted you to do. Um, I'm not a good multitasker. Hang on, let me just type it in the chat. <laughs> Cast.org. I got it pulled up on my screen usually. <laughs> I have no connections in my corpus callosum, so I can't. Be <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so so yeah, that that textbook it was meant to be encountered online because it's trying to demonstrate what would a textbook look like if it was designed with UDR principles from the get go, with multiple means of representation, action, expression, engagement, so on and so forth. Um, that really is served best in a digital format, but they used the book builder to make that book. And so if you build something in Book Builder, you get, for example, the text toolbar built into the book, highlighters, and you know, all these other features are can be part of the book. And it's totally they use, they use Book Builder for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. I need to re-explore it. When I went through it the first time, I felt it was a little clunky and it was um some of the options and that um I was having a hard time making it kind of adult enough. Mm -hmm. Um but but that book is obviously, it's great. So I'll have to re-examine that. Thank you for that tip. No problem. And I'll get the link to Book Builder to you. I'd like to add a little bit to what uh, Jennifer said too, and she doesn't realize that she used this word that's now very important to my podcast, but um, it, it she said putting UDL in context and I just between this morning session and today tonight I finally sent the email to some of our friends at CAST uh, including Allison Posey and um, a, a, I, I'm hoping to bring up the chatter so is this a con I don't know if it's a connector or if it's a salesperson because I'm not sure if I know all the differences between each one of those categories but um, I'm hoping that um, with, you know, together, um, we can raise the chatter about UDL and all of its different ways of um, engaging in multiple contexts, um, and especially post-secondary, so um, in the university setting. But also, when I was speaking with the, the three folks that came down to North Carolina from CAST, we're thinking about all different um, ways, not just in a course, um, but also in how the university welcomes people, how job creation, how job production, uh, interviews, how the boardroom is, how systems, you know, are more UDL um, friendly and guided by UDL. So um, I am really happy to be in touch with so many people um, and hope over this uh, who are interested and in at the vanguard of UDL. In higher ed because I'm hoping to or putting together a podcast which is changing its name already <laughs> hasn't really been uh, luckily we haven't put the production in yet but uh, from course fit how do things fit in your course to probably UDL in context so looking at how UDL is placed in context in so many different contexts so that could include higher ed could include course design could be in class activity you know all the different ways that UDL uh, reshapes and can reshape our world and can make our world more equitable more accessible uh, more 
uh, just uh, any number of things. Alison Posey had said it's UDL for something, so for social justice, for inclusion, for um, ex, you know, excellence, for um, uh, inclusive excellence, or things like that. So um, I, I love hearing what each of you all are doing where you are, and um, maybe sometime over the summer I get a chance to talk talk to people and interview and, and put these things out um, so that th there's a, a podcast, there's a way to listen to this, you know, while you're driving in the car or something like that, or on the, um, on, a, on the train or something. So um, I, I still don't know if that makes it a connector or if it's a sales um, person, but uh, I would be interested in, in talking to all different kinds because I've already learned something from this conversation about the design element with the WCAG. Um, I'm definitely more on the faculty development and not on the instructional design part. So um, that was a really important piece for me to know of too. So I thank, thank you for that. Can I share something? So, uh, there was a, a lady from New Zealand sharing her story of using UDL. I forgot her name, but her story was powerful. It made me think that at our school, we um, were doing baby steps and we have uh, a few, like 10 or 12 instructors uh, creating open textbooks. Uh, but I guess I, we never thought about creating the open text in a culturally diversified way. We never thought like, uh, who are using our open text? How can we make it uh, culturally, socially more um, accessible? Um, it's not just, oh, we teach this, we use this, now it's made available for you. Um, what? Um, Think we never thought truly about the receiving end, like uh, how to make it easier for them to customize. Uh, um, so that's a very interesting point to me to take away. And some great quotes that I learned from the conference, like people think, uh, how to think about this. Uh, um, something that I was uh, um, practicing, um, so like my journey into this UDL, it's like less than a year, <laughs> very new. And but the, luckily I had a great relationship with the faculty members I work with. So, so I talked to five of them and the two of them said, oh, maybe later, the three of them said, sure, let's do something, let's try something. So that was very well received and uh, uh, so starting now, I'm working with the summer cohort, the fall, and the next year's cohort of instructors. And so what I did, <laughs> I kind of tricked them into it. So uh, something I started to implement is uh, after, I think either it was Eric's course or or it was a uh, um, uh, learner uh, foundation of learner experience design course uh, MOOC course I took uh, they are at the beginning of each module they, they tell the student um, how long on average it will take a student to complete this module maybe Eric did that in his course too uh, I have to look back but I thought that was a wonderful idea so I started to implement that in my courses and I had that and also reading materials how long um, how how long it would take an average student to complete this reading uh, so now when I meet with my instructors I tell them I I require you to give me this information. I don't tell them, it, it, you can choose to give me or not. I just tell them, you are required to give me this information. So. Other things, they may say, oh, I may want to do this or I don't want to do this, but everyone has reading material. So I require them to give me like how long it will take your average student to complete this reading. That's one tip I'm doing, and it's been quite successful. 
Yeah. Well, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds good. So, so far, um, I'm try trying to synthesize what we're saying. It sounds like um, there's need to hear from each other and, and learn more about, um, you know, our success stories, our best practices, that sort of thing. Uh, that's kind of what we do here. Obviously, an, an hour is, is not a long time for, for us to be able to do that very well. I wonder if we might be able to get CAST and or the IRN um, to support us in, in actually doing some sort of film, you know, come on campus and film for a couple of days, get interviews, you know, like showcase some stuff and put together some profiles of, you know, kind of what they did for the UD on campus website, but maybe in, in you know, sort of updates or in greater details. And, and, you know, maybe we could help map those to where people are in the process and begin to see what is the process, you know, um, so we start to see patterns emerge, that kind of thing. Um, we're talking about, okay. go ahead. Oh, like the process for integration and scaling? Yeah. Is that what, okay, yeah. yes. Yeah, and so, um, you know, if, if we come and just, just have these sort of interviews and, and whatever and kind of get a feel for where, where people are and, and then taking all those stories and, and mapping it into a sort of what does integration and scaling look like in the context of different higher ed settings kind of thing. Wouldn't that be cool? And um, I threw in the chat too, you guys might be familiar with it. Um, it's, it's older, it's from Teaching Every Student, mm -hmm. but that was the, there's a, it's like a systemic change model. There's eight elements, but it's really K to 12. Mm -hmm. um, but I really like that too, in terms of conversations beyond a classroom or an individual team mm -hmm. about creating UDL based systemic change throughout the school. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just throw that in there because it's something that you could riff off of or customize. Um, at our school, we put together kind of our own version of it um, because it is, it just gives some different ideas to think about in terms of scaling um, and that the shifts that different parts of the dynamic organization need to make mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when moving up and that small changes can be big changes kind of thing as well. Right, right. Um, I was hearing that people would benefit from, from hearing and sharing um, concrete strategies for implementing UDL. So when we're working with faculty, when we're talking to administrators, you know, it's really hard for me. I'm a very theoretical person and I like the ideals of, of UDL. I'm thinking about it in that way. And I drive my boss nuts because she's like, tell me what you're going to tell the faculty to do <laughs> for their class on Monday. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't, I need to talk to them. <laughs> you know, but um, I understand the value of, of concrete strategies and being able to convert UDL theory into practice. So that's something I would benefit from. I'm hearing from you guys as well. Um, talking about ideas for bringing UDL to different settings on campus, not just the classroom, but the library, career services, whatever. Um, what does it mean to, to be a self-advocate when you go into job interviews? You know, that kind of thing could really um, tap into UDL as well. Um, and develop some, some sort of resource bank, and that might be, we just start with College Stars because they have a pretty awesome resource bank. Is, that, is it open-ended, like people could, can, can contribute to it as well? So that's a good question. So um, everyone can access it through the collegestar.org website, but in terms of contributions, they go to um, a review panel, which um, a case study or a module is pitched. The review panel decides if they're going to um, fund that to be developed. It is nice that we do have a little bit of grant funding. So if you are going to develop a case study, I mean, you can um, earn 500 bucks, which is great opportunity and then have your name associated with it but um it, it what we found that we need to do is to make sure that the uh case studies and the modules that are being presented really um integrate udl it's not just that they match udl guidelines but you're really having that big picture of how you're incorporating those principles of udl into the topic or concept so you like tagging it based on the guideline that it supports? Um, 
some individuals have tagged it, but the proposal just starts with a very broad, it's very short, it's not long to do, but it's basically, you know, this, this is what I do and this is how it relates to one or more principles of universal design for learning. We're really looking at getting those very practical, practical things about what can I do in class on Monday? So what, what can I try one step at a time? And um, it might not represent all um, principles of UDL. It might just be one focusing on engagement or representation, but there are several examples that are out there right now where we're, um, you know, looking for more, uh, willing to have feedback on what's out there already. Uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on that when you were talking, Eric, about looking at other pockets in campus, we've started tinkering with like a UDL self audit. What would a certain office on campus, how would they examine um, what they do in terms of UDL? So I would absolutely love to vet it by the folks in this group for for feedback, I mean, just it's just in a very, very rough draft, but just the idea of as we're branching out to get to that, um, um, you know, total picture, how we're incorporating um, everyone and including students too. We've started a little bit of talk in our um, Pirate Academic Success Center and then within our um, STEP student support program about really getting students aware of what universal design for learning is and how they can advocate it, not just as learners, but as they take it to the workforce with them. Mm -hmm. So just all new territory for us and we're just um, super excited to have folks that are willing to um, collaborate. Awesome. Yeah, that's so that's so wicked. As I scroll through, I want to take a much deeper dive into collegestar.org. <laughs> so going back to the idea of Mavens, connectors, and salespeople, and being being all three, um, those might be you know you don't have to, but those might be triggers to be thinking about what is it that we need. So if if you need to improve as a Maven, what kind of knowledge or or support do you need for that? you know, and same thing for being a connector or salesperson, what, what, um, if anything was possible, you know, just brainstorming here, uh, what do you need to do your job better as UDL navigators and pioneers? One thing in terms of connection that I need to prioritize um, outside of um, even when you're in the busyness of campus is maintaining these relationships and cultivating these relationships like these sparks that I'm getting like oh connecting with the college star and there was some stuff about faculty development in the morning session as well I really want to commit to following up on those even if they're just a quick email to follow up and say hey college star folks let's talk more about this this looks really cool or some some kind of way to to extend that beyond just our time here together and take it live right take it um in and integrate it into our work so that's something i really want to um make sure i need some practice some strategies on emailing right away <laughs> what ideas do, do you jody or anybody else have for how we might do that relationship cultivating beyond this time It's a hard part. It is a hard yeah. part. I'm gonna I'm gonna put my sales hat on now. So, um, as part of College Star, we do have funding to support learning communities. So, I mean, if there are individuals that really want to have those continued conversations, if they really want to look at um, trying something within their classroom, within a safe environment with colleagues, and having those discussions, I mean, there is a little bit of support available for that through the structure that we have. Um, but but that's a little bit more of a commitment than the follow-up email. It's, you know, what are you going to do to move the work forward to contribute to the research base? But I'm happy um, to send everyone information on, on those opportunities. But um, going back to Jody was, what Jody was saying, I mean, I just felt horrible today. I was just sending out, you know, it was great to meet you notes that I had to change last week to last month because I was so slow about following up on it. So I, I would love that, you know, can, continued momentum of um, following up quicker and having a way to do so. 
Does anybody use Slack? Um, because, yeah, I feel like Slack could be a potentially just, it has kind of that um, text DIM feel, but we can set up channels within Slack depending on, you know, for different initiatives or different topics. But I find that that's a pretty good way to, to kind of instantly and asynchronously, you know, keep in touch. So if anybody else is interested, I could look into setting up, um, you know, something and, um, you know. <laughs> can you use Slack as... You know, it's not its primary function, but but can you use Slack as a de facto lister? That is a good question. I don't know. You know, I will look into that and uh, see if I can get some information. Um, we use Slack here. I know it's you can set up free accounts. I don't know what the limitation is on that, and I also don't know what the limitations are on the free. I just know we use it here, and I love it, <laughs> but I didn't set it up. But um, let me get some information and, and maybe send that to you, and we can talk about if that would be, um, you know, an, a, a, a usable solution. That'd be great. That's awesome. Thanks, Julie. Sure. And just looping back to the PLC idea as well. Like, so one of the con one of the things that's come up in our conversations with the SIG, too, is is it more of a PLC, or is it just like a – water cooler almost where you just meet up like a town square and um uh, but after the summit and just thinking uh and talking to some of the faculty at my college too there's such a appetite for a plc and i would love to be part of we have a, our college is relatively small so we have some great faculty but um but i would just love to see them connecting with other faculty outside of uh, even our ontario context um, and so doing something inter-organizationally or internationally, I think would be, um, we'd have some folks who would be into that. Um, maybe not May, June, but September for sure. Our time frame is really flexible and it really is up to the groups to decide that group leader and to decide the direction they're going to head and um, the topic that they're going to look at. Um, because we do have a little funding behind it, it is more than water cooler. We have to have some kind of a product that comes out of um, the um, learning community, but there's really no set determined timelines or structure as far as who's in, I mean, it's, you know, thank goodness for technology and being able to collaborate virtually. So we really welcome any, any ideas right now. Um, we have a Canvas platform. I heard several of you um, singing the praises to Canvas. So we do have a Canvas platform that is created where folks can house their specific learning communities and documents on. Um, right now we have WebEx, but we're looking at very shortly acquiring Zoom. So we do have those components. But um, as we have have it written right now into our specific funding, you know, there would have to be some sort of an outcome from the learning community, but it could be very flexible. And just to um, reiterate, uh, I know I mentioned faculty learning communities, but we're also looking at champions and looking at learning communities that are maybe are made up of staff or um, other individuals that, you know, have a direct impact on students, but, you know, don't have that faculty role. So I just, I, I welcome any um, connections, any leads, and um, just really um, want to offer out that resource while we have the funding to support that. Awesome. That's fabulous because that's something that we could promote here as well. And if we're also one of the things we're hoping to do is if there's other people who want to take um, a leadership role, whether it's temporary or a little bit longer term commitment uh, within our community, um, there, that we can help foster some of those things as well. So like maybe there's some folks here who want to take on uh, um, co-facilitating or, or setting up a PLC. That'd be amazing. Okay, I'm just cognizant of the time and, uh, and so want to just um, uh, do a brief wrap up and then offer Eric and others a chance to say any closing comments as we kind of wrap up our evening version of the water cooler. Um, and as I cycle back to my notes, because I also can't speak and click. <laughs> uh, just one second. Perfect. Um, 
so yeah, so thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs> um, we're going to, we're working on this listserv Slack kind of idea. So stay tuned for that. Um, also, we're trying to build kind of a Twitter presence. So look for our hashtag UDLAG um, on Twitter and, and contribute to that as well. Some ideas that have come up for alternate ways to connect are like the, what are they called? Like Mindy does them, the like Twitter, chat things like when everybody meets on Twitter those things um, but for like those kind of scrums for higher ed uh, the listserv and also um, encouraging everyone to meet to build some partnerships off the sides of the water cooler with folks who seem to be going in a similar direction or are learning similar things um, and so our next um, Oh, our next meeting we'll send out. It's in August, we're thinking, um, but we'll send out some times. Also, we're trying, we're going to have a web page on the IRM website to just curate some of our information in a one, one spot. So stay tuned for that as well. And Eric, I'll just pass it over to you for any closing comments and then we can offer it to the floor. Yeah, so we, the list of people who have expressed interest in this group has grown to be about 70 strong. Um, and of those, um, you know, we, we get made, so our, our biggest um, of these types of, of meetings has been about 12 people. And I think we'll about match that this time. And so, um, you know, we're, we're not totally sure why we're only getting 12 people coming to this when there's like 75 people who say that they want to be involved with this. Um, you know, some of it might just be, it sounded good to me when I was at the conference and then the wheels hit the road and I, <laughs> I don't have time for this kind of thing. Um, or it, it might be that this just isn't the medium for some people. And so the, the more avenues we can facilitate, um, like Twitter chat and like, you know, whatever, um, so maybe some in-person meetings. Some people just really just want to be in person with people when they're talking about these things. Anything we can do for that to meet the needs of different people in our community is great. Um, we, you know, we're going to get very quickly to the point that it's beyond what Jody and I can manage. And so going back to reiterating what she was saying, we're, we're you know, like Jody and I are not really the leaders of this group. We just happen to be the people who came together and started it. But, you know, we are all UDL leaders in the field. And so feel free to carry the, the banner, you know, in, in, in different ways as we reach out to the community. Um, and we really do appreciate and, and grow with these kinds of things. It's, this is something, you know, I've said, I think every time that this is something that our work can be very isolating um, and, and it can be very, hard to feel like we're the only ones doing this kind of work and I, um, and so just just knowing that there are other people who are experiencing what we're experiencing and have, have learned something that we haven't yet and can can learn from us something that we've experienced is so powerful to have that community so i kind of see see this as like a place where we go to recharge and, you know as we then carry this this mission forward as UDL navigators um, we are going to try this time, we, uh, every time we try to expand this conversation, this is really just a spark, and an hour is not enough time to, for, to go in depth with all the wonderful things that we have to say. So it's intended to be a, a catalyst to facilitate further stuff. And so um, we'll make sure that, um, or if, if you can make sure that your contact information is there in the, in the notes, um, and feel free to, if somebody said something that that's really something you want to follow up with, please do follow up with them directly. Um, and of course you can um, message all of us if you would like to carry on the conversation. We'll probably follow up with some sort of um, questions or something that might drive, drive this into more practical things going forward. Like for example, reaching out to CAST or the IRN to, to carry forward that idea. Would you be willing to, um, to develop this sort of, video series of, of what's going on on different campuses. Um, you know, we'll try to carry that forward a bit. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> that's great. Well, um, we'll open the floor if anyone wants to say any goodbyes or closing comments. But uh, with that, I will say a, a good night and see you soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Yep, take care.